You are listening to Veggie Doctor Radio, and this is episode number 96. Hey, I'm your host, Dr. Yami. I'm a board certified pediatrician, certified health and wellness coach, author, and speaker. I'm also a passionate promoter of the power of diet and lifestyle in preventing and reversing chronic disease and bringing joy and longevity into our lives. This podcast is focused on plant-based nutrition, habit formation, motivation, and mindset so that you can have the tools to live the best life possible. Are you ready to get started? Let's do this. My message is love. Love yourself, love your family, love your neighbor, and above all, love our planet. Well, veggie lovers, welcome back to the last Sunday of the month of April, which means that it is our last expert episode on climate change and sustainability. And I'm a little sad because this has been so fun. What a fun project to talk about these things, talk about topics that expand our minds, but it also expand our hearts. And I think that this is the perfect episode to end on. It is so incredibly inspirational so much love, so much hope, so much positivity. I really, really hope that you love it. My guest today is Dr. Reese Halter, who is actually a forensic naturalist. Super interesting and loving guy. So I'm going to talk more about him in just a minute. But before I get to that, If you haven't already, could you please subscribe to my newsletter? Two ways to do it. You can text the word fiber, F-I-B-E-R, to 66866, or you can go to my website, dryami.com, D-O-C-T-O-R-Y-A-M-I.com forward slash sign up. And you can be added to my newsletter. That way you don't miss any episodes and you can get exclusive tidbits that I only share with my newsletter subscribers getting better and better. So I appreciate that. So thank you so much for all of you that have already signed up for my newsletter. I really appreciate you. And thank you so much for coming back every week to listen to Veggie Doctor Radio. I hear from some of you that are such loyal listeners and are listening to every episode, giving me feedback. I really appreciate that. I want to hear from you. I want to make this podcast better and better. So let me know what you really like. Let me know what you don't like so much or what you wish I talked more about or who you want me to talk to. Let me know. The only way I can get better is if you give me feedback. So you can do it on social media. I'm on Instagram and Facebook at the Dr. Yami. Also, you can email me, Yami at dryami.com. Remember, doctor is spelled out, D-O-C-T-O-R-Y-A-M-I.com. So feel free to give me feedback so that I can make this podcast better for you because that's why I'm here. I want to give a shout out to a reviewer who left me a review on Apple Podcasts. It is Hanny MCL, titled it LOVE in all caps, I learn something new every time. I love Dr. Yami. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And thank you for being a listener and for coming back every week and listening to these episodes. Remember that the information on this podcast is for informational and educational purposes only. It is not meant to replace careful evaluation and treatment by a medical provider. So if you have concerns about your own health or your child's health, please consult a doctor. Well, let's hear more about Dr. Reese Halter. Quote, Dr. Reese is to global warming what Steve Irwin was to wild animals, end quote. A student says of Dr. Reese Halter, a prolific author, broadcaster, and environmental advocate who vociferously warns of the imperative need to save trees, bees, 
and C's. Halter designed Muse School's science curriculum and is a former professor at California Lutheran University. He's a forensic naturalist who broadcasts extensively in Australia, and he mourns its habitat and ecosystem losses. He's also an ardent supporter of Gen Z's efforts for climate justice. Quote, I'm a full-time advocate for Mother Earth, and my forthcoming book, Gen Z Emergency, addresses the need for climate justice. If we have no trees, we have no life. American cities have lost more than 180 million trees, which cast invaluable shade, afford habitat for our planetary partners, recharge aquifers, and provide oxygen, end quote. Just like our planet's climate, insects are also in trouble, Halter warns. He urges lawmakers to enact laws mandating stringent environmental measures be implemented and enforced. So, this interview with Dr. Reese Halter, we talk about a lot of different things. We talk about being right in the middle of the sixth mass extinction of the planet. What does that mean? Why is it happening? But we talk about what we can do instead of getting depressed, how can we get active? How can we start to make changes? And one of those changes is with our diets. So we definitely talk about veganism, why it's important. And we also talk about pollinators and bees and how fascinating and interesting they are but also what we can do in our own backyards. So I know that this is going to be a very important episode. I hope that it really impacts you like deep down in your soul, the way I felt it when I was talking with Dr. Reese. Thank you so much for listening to this series. Thank you for everything that you do every day for some of the little sacrifices that you make to help make our planet a healthier place, to help your family be healthier, to help yourself feel better and have improved well-being. I really appreciate that. And I know that it's not easy every single day, especially when it comes to forming new habits. So that's why this podcast is to help you, to inspire you to keep it up, to be consistent, to make change even when change is difficult. I know you can do it. Find a community, find a partner that will help you reach out to me. There's lots of people that can help you. And if you're already plugging along, doing the work, I thank you. And now let's listen to this inspiring and loving episode of Veggie Doctor Radio. I hope that you have a very plantastic week and I will catch you next week right here. Dr. Reese Halter, this is so exciting to have you on Veggie Doctor Radio. Welcome. Thank you very much. Stoked to be with you. Well, I am so excited about this interview. I know that this is going to be an excellent way to end this sustainability series. So let's just jump right in to a very cheerful topic here. It has been said that we are currently living in the sixth mass extinction of the planet. Yeah. What does that mean and why is it happening? Well, it's man-driven, M-A-N, man. Men have uh, run roughshaw uh, over our planet for 9,000 years. And I-, I pull no punches. We have raped just about everything that can be raped. And-, and-, and it's a time now, it's a feminine time, it's a maternal time. Mother Earth needs especially all the women and the the feminine nurturing energy the there have been at least five uh, other mass extinctions uh, on our planet and we are in the midst of the sixth mass extinction right now and frighteningly it's happening at least a thousand times faster than the previous five and as i said earlier it's man driven and and it just comes down to consumerism you know if we get back to the basics all children are born as natural ecologists 
society teaches them to become sociopathic consumers. Ladies and gentlemen, happiness is not derived from purchasing things. Happiness is a fleeting moment. I, I wish for all to embrace uh, harmony, joy, uh, love, and, and so many other high vibrational moments that can be found within and with uh, going into nature, whether it's your back garden, whether it's standing next to a big old tree on your property or in a green space and preferably going for a walk in a forest, you will find not only a peace and, and a harmony, but, but actually our health, our health, our mind, our body is, it gets that injection of, uh, uh, of uh, energy and smell and smell and sound. Yeah, and this is actually evidence-based. So we know, especially for children that suffer from things like ADHD, mm -hmm. that connecting back to nature actually helps them with their behaviors. And what you're saying is that we're born this way, right? We're born connected That's to nature. We're born loving nature, being curious. Little kids, they want to play in the dirt. They want to feel things. They want to see little bugs and creatures and things like that. But then over time, we become disconnected. So can you tell us a little bit more specifically about how our choices, and like you said, for these 9,000 years, our increasingly consumer desires, how has this been affecting the climate in particular? Well, uh, look, everything is based on our energy and our, our, our consumption. And, and currently, we're, as usual, living off the back of Mother Nature and, and the, the carbon-based energies, which were mostly plants, some animals, uh, that it took 1.1 billion years of reproductive evolution and an unfathomable amount of, of green life and other life to, to yield us these, uh, these gases and uh, the, the, the liquids, solids, and, and gases. I think it's really important if we take a couple steps back. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds sciencey, but look, I am a scientist, and, and I'll put on my uh, science triangle for a second. Matter is neither created nor destroyed. It's, it's simply transformed. So I think if, if we look at when you burn a lump of coal the size of your fist or a gallon of gasoline, a liquid, and the coal, obviously a solid, they transform into a gas. And when we burn that, that's energy. And, and it's heat primarily. 90 plus, some say 93% of all that heat in the combustion process is locked into our oceans. The oceans drive our climate, right? And, and we are irrefutably, there, there is no question that, that the human footprint is heating our planet, our oceans. And, and, and um, scientists, if, if, if people only remember one thing of this profession, science, we measure and we, we exquisitely measure very, very accurately in the 21st century. And so the, the heat, to give the, the listeners an, an understanding, the, the heat 2018 was the hottest year in the oceans ever. And what does that mean? Well, I could give you a number, a Zeta Joule number, but what does that mean if we put it in, in terms of maybe something that a human mind could understand? The, the amount of heat each day in 2018 that we were putting into the oceans from burning fossil fuels was equal to detonating 400,000 Nagasaki-style atomic bombs each day and it, it's it that's inconceivable but let me fast forward one year to 2019 which was was the another record-breaking 
hot ocean year. And the amount of heat each day went from 400,000 Nagasaki-style bombs to over 1 million Nagasaki-style bombs. The oceans are broiling. And so we know that, right? So if we, if we dial back people, human beings, are wonderful problem solvers and we're very elegant tool makers. That's what we do. So, so what can we do knowing that the situation is, is getting untenable? Because I just, Australia, my home uh, away from home, just went through the most horrible uh, uh, heat, drought, and fires that, that, that we've ever witnessed in modern times, we can transition very quickly away from these fossil fuels. We have the technology, and the listeners may not understand this, but they need to. Would you imagine, and you can't unless, but it, it is very true, the International Monetary Fund put this out uh, four years ago, Fossil fuel companies are receiving $5.3 trillion annually to kill our planet. And, and so what we can do here is refuse to give that money to them, spend the $5 trillion each year on, our, on uh, future proofing and going solar. We have these solar technologies and imagine in, uh, by 2030, we would have spent, we will have spent 50 trillion dollars and we can walk away from this this pollution and 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 let's say all of that doesn't bother you let's say you 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 live in a bubble and you 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 don't like science where everybody should be very concerned is the air that we're breathing in the cities the air the fossil fuel exhaust exhaust fumes and diesel is a terrible culprit it's giving all of us alzheimer's and we know this from my colleagues um, from mexico who looked at dogs they were called in and all these dogs were howling and and losing and 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 they they, they were lost and when they examined their brains they all had the uh plaque that was associated with, uh, with Alzheimer's. When my colleagues went from dogs to 203 uh, young children and young adults under, under 40 years, they found 99.5% of all of them, which is just about every 203 person, had the telltales of Alzheimer's from breathing this toxic air. Hello. Is that what our, our, our legacy is? And I believe not. So I'm very excited of the technologies. It's a time to, you know, change is, is opportunity in disguise. And everyone has trusted science because everyone I know has these mobile devices. And, and, and it's time now to put our faith in science, not the fear mongering. There, there's, there's a terrible situation that we're facing with. It's an us versus them. But guess what? This is our only home. So we have to come together. And it, it starts with backing off on consuming. You know, I, I put it to all the listeners. No one wants somebody to, to work for nothing. That's just not right. And we have laws in America and elsewhere that protect the worker because workers have rights we're all people so why should we expect people on the other side of the world to work for uh, either in a slavery situation or it's such meager wages and not have the rights that we have and i think that the moving forward we're going to find that our little communities each of our communities each of our counties each of our states are going to go back to the first principles and start to make things locally. I know as a vegan, and I know for you too, we support our farmers' markets. I grow my a lot of my own food, but what I can't grow, I get from my local 
uh, 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 friends. And we're going to have to go back to that because it's the other thing just isn't working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. So in some ways, it sounds very bleak. But what I'm hearing from you is that there's hope that there's still time if we take action and make some changes right now. Absolutely. There, there, look, uh, don't get depressed, uh, get active. And, and each of us are powerful people. And, and when we band together, we're an unstoppable force. And each moment of every day, we select, we make choices, and those choices wind up in purchases. So when we come together as a, as a force here, we refuse to buy stuff that, that hurts our planet and, and, and hurts our families. And when we all make choices together, corporations change really, really quickly. So I, I, can't, um, I, I can't beg people enough to understand that, that we all must make changes and we all matter. And so for plant-based, because here's the thing, uh, the, the, this selection of, of eating animals, which is insane in the first place, because all things, uh, all, all life, uh, and, and certainly animal life, feels pain. We know that. No one willingly wants to create pain. And more than that, who wants to uh, give, feed their family food that's going to give them dis-ease and no one and 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 we know with plant-based that that it's it's obviously it's gentle but it's healthy and it's much easier on our planet our our water footprint and 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 all of the greenhouse gases that go into clearing land that go into feeding the the cattle and injecting them in America with antibiotics, even though they're not sick, and on and on, and and the nerve poisons that are being put on the soy and the corn that kill the bees and 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 kill the soil life. We know this, right? So. Look, life is a learning curve, and we all, I've only made 10 million mistakes, maybe 10 and a half million, but I try and correct that. Mm -hmm. And as a race, we can't continue to go down a path where we're harming our only planet. And we have great options. And, you know, getting back to becoming a plant based person, it's not an all or nothing. Look, try for 24 hours. Go and, and master that. And then in a couple of weeks, go for two days. You'll find that every kind of food you've ever thought of is veganized, if that's what you're looking for. But you'll also find that, that the, this, the, the taste in, in our vegetables, and, and it'll bring people back. Look, Frank Lloyd Wright said, the heart of the home is the kitchen. And, and every parent knows that you're going to find what went on during the day with your children when they're around the kitchen and around the table. Cooking is an essential part or creating. I don't think of it as cooking because I create in the kitchen. Everyone can create. And uh, I don't, um, I eat a lot of raw stuff, not hundred percent, but it's just so easy and fun. And it brings our children back to nature because let's say even if you live in a, a flat or an apartment or a condo or whatever you want to call it, you, and you have a little balcony, you can grow a couple tomatoes and you can grow some peppers and, and, and then the kids see the bees, right? And, and it's a connect. And we're just trying to bring people back to our mother, the, the earth. And, and really slow down on the consumption. This plastic thing, plastics are a, a, a fossil petroleum-based product. We take 12%, 12 million barrels every day go into this horrible thing. It's in everything. It's in the air. It's in the water. It's in the food. It's in the soil. It's in the animals. It's in us. And it's in the oceans by a, a, a stunning amount. And we need to back off on that. Those, those are poisons. So I'm, I'm, I'm heartened. I'm mostly heartened because kids in the Gen Zs, the, the under 25s, oh boy, do they get it. And oh boy, are they pissed off that adults have lied to them and, and they demand change and, and they're bringing change on with, with open arms 
And I've got a new book, uh, Gen Z Emergency, coming out later this year that's all about this revolution and all of, of the solutions. There are thousands of solutions. It's so exciting. It's their future. They may only make up 25% of the planet, but they own 100% of the future, and they're, they, they're taking it on. And, and with taking it on, I might add, and the listener, this will resonate with many of the listeners, the Gen Zs are eschewing debt, right? They don't want to have debt. Mm-hmm. When I went to school for 100 years, it seems, 100 years ago, I didn't come away with two, 300000 in debt. What? It's become a predatory industry. Mm-hmm. Instead, the Gen Zs are becoming makers, right? They're repurposing things. They're growing. And, they, and, and they're not starting their lives with 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 two three hundred thousand dollars in the hole just to to eke out and and in the cities it's unaffordable so many of the gen z's now are, are going into tiny homes and tiny home communities are springing up and and they're growing their own food it's it's an exciting time yeah no you are so right and this is so perfect timing for this conversation because I actually just saw a lecture by Chuck Underwood. I don't know if you know who he is. He's a generational Mm -hmm. um, study guy. So I'm going to have him on the podcast too, but I think exactly what you're thinking as far as the next generation, my children, because my children are already interested in this. They don't want to have debt. Right. They want to they want to do everything they can to conserve, but part of it is because we're teaching them. So yes. in order to form a new generation, they have to have certain values and beliefs that are different from the generation before them. And we're seeing these changes and evolution. You yeah, mentioned the absolutely. bees, and I want to get into the bees because I have a lot of questions about bees. But oh, I the love the bees. They're I my best. Tell bestie. you is. Um, <laughs> Disney Plus. So we subscribe to Disney Plus because I got really interested in this whole Mandalorian thing. Okay. So I was like, everybody's seeing this baby Yoda. I need to see the baby Yoda. So we subscribed to Disney Plus. We finished the Mandalorian. So then we started exploring all the different things on there. And one of the documentaries is called Wings of Life, which is about pollinators. And it just blew my mind because I knew that bees and all this stuff was important, but I didn't know how vital and how critical they are to the earth's ecosystem. So can you tell me more about pollinators and what they do and why it's important that we support them? Sure, I can. There are at best guess, and and these estimates are always going up, but there are now estimated to be 400,000 different kinds of plants, most of them are flowering, uh, meaning that uh, nature selected the insects to to take the pollen and cross pollinate. The pollinators uh, are responsible for when I say pollinators, I, I mean some twenty thousand kinds of bees, some five thousand kinds of hoverflies, moths, uh, um, butterflies. Uh, even even our friends, the bats, ants, they are responsible for pollinating uh, almost 90%, 360,000 kinds of plants. Now, uh, for a biologist like me, a geek, uh, that is like, oh my gosh, wow. Now, for the average person who may be not intimately associated with plants, to bring it back to the ground, the pollinators uh, give us uh, 75, they pollinate 75% of our food crops. No pollinators, no food, no people. It's just as simple as that. And the pollinators, like all other forms of life, live within a very narrow habitable range of temperatures, right? Once those temperatures, highs or lows, are breached, they can't make a living. And they can't make a living and and also the plants can't flower. Now, back to basic biology for the bees, what is it that, that attracts the bee to the flower? Well, some 130 million years ago, because wind was the former cross-pollinator, nature 
I guess, thought, well, putting all our eggs in one basket, as the saying goes, may not be so good. So let's bring on these insects to do the heavy lifting, to move the pollen from one flower to another and cross-pollinate. How do we do that? Well, let's entice these little beauties with a sweet nectar. And that's what the bees pull into the flowers. They smell it, they sense it, they move in, they take that uh, nectar and they dehydrate it. And they add a couple of their enzymes from their gut and they turn it into this most exquisite honey. And in the process, their bodies are electrostatically charged. They a few pollen grains and, and bees are very hairy. A few pollen grains get lodged on their hair. And, and also bees collect the pollen. The honey is their only food source, but they do collect plant pollen because it's the on, their only source of protein, which they need to feed the, the larvae, the young, w mixed with honey to, to get them strong. Uh, and 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 also um, they feed, by the way, the queen uh, pure protein her entire 24 to 26 day incubation period. So so that's how nature entices the bees, some 20,000 kinds, to do the heavy lifting. There are other pollinators, but the bees are are the main the main pollinators. And, and, and it, the dance goes on. The concern today, to be very candid, is that each year man makes and uh, thrusts 250 billion metric tons of terrible poisons into the biosphere, all the living parts of the world, the air, the soil, the water, the oceans. And the bees, like the canaries in the coal mines, oh, 100 years or so ago, when the miners took the birds down and when the, when the shafts uh, bled toxic gas, gases and the birds died, the miners got out of Dodge real quickly. Uh, the bees are, are dying uh, by the, now by the trillions from all these poisons. So, you know, again, we made a mistake. Life is, is learning and we correct our behavior. And, and it's the corn and the soy um, in America which feeds the, the animals that are really harming us. You know, the, it's, it's a stunning statistic. Less than 4% of the United States arable land is planted to fruit veggies, nuts, and seeds. Ladies and gentlemen, the United States of America could feed planet Earth a, a vegan, a, a plant-based diet if we walked away from this wretched corn and soy that's killing not only the bees and other pollinators, not only the soils, it's toxifying the water. And, and these poisons stick around. And, and as you mentioned earlier, some people say, oh, this guy's full of hot air. No, I'm not. I'm a scientist. Everything I've said, you can go. It's, it's, it's science-based. And it's really important. For some reason or another, the, this uh, anti-science nonsense has gained such a head of steam and and I, I don't own a corporation I, I, from this broadcast and all the work that I lovingly do I'm not making trillions I'm not making billions I'm not even making millions I'm doing this because I love our planet and I want our children to have a, a good future so for every problem there are three solutions and and we've got this thing we we've got the blueprint we we know the medicines to feed the bees they they come from nature they come from the fungus they come bees know where their medicines are and the bees by the way are inex inextricably linked to the the ancient forests right they when they get sick they go to these red belted uh, polypore uh, mushrooms and they take the extract and they make powerful honey and they get themselves better. Like how cool is that? <laughs> That's so fascinating. Well, can you tell us a few other 
fun facts about bees? Because I know that you love bees and you have a whole book on bees. So what are some other cool things that most people don't know about bees? Okay. Uh, well, The Incomparable Honeybee is, is uh, uh, oh, um, my book. It's had a couple prints, and but you can find so much if you dial Reese Halter and bees on Google. But here's why they the bees, the honeybees. So the honeybees are, of the 20,000 bees, the, the honeybees uh, are, are the commercial beekeepers uh, uh, go-to. These are creatures that are, are really super smart. And, and I'm going to quantify this. First of all, the bees live in cities of somewhere between 50 and 100,000 occupants. They are 98.5% all female uh, workers, and it's, it's governed by a, a central queen. The queen's role is to make little little ones and and she makes little ones in four years the queen a, a healthy queen can make approximately four million eggs and and so uh that's stunning how they keep order in a city when this when the workers get sick in a city of fifty thousand, they it's hardwired in them to leave the nest and never return so they don't infect their their nest mates but the bees uh, there's just so much to them for instance after four years the queen the old queen has to move she the the her the bees work on chemicals they they they, they sniff their 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 sniffing hounds extraordinaire as it were and when the the older queen starts to r release less scent the workers downstairs in the nursery all of a sudden uh, get this note and they begin to feed a half a dozen or so eggs pure protein, which, which by the way, they make from their body. The, the vitelligen is this wonderful protein. And the first queen after 24 or 26 or 27 days, it's not everything is so exact, but in that uh, area, the first queen to hatch, um, she has the dubious uh, honor of going around fight in the nursery, discovering where the other queens that are about to hatch live, and she murders them because there can only be one monarch in the hive. But in the meantime, in the meantime, the the um, worker bees upstairs, well, they've gone to to uh, find a new location for the, the the old queen. When they find, when they think they've found the perfect, and they find maybe a half dozen possible new places, they vote. They vote, ladies and gentlemen, and the quorum is thirteen or fourteen bees that agree on the new site. And then they evacuate with maybe half the workers. So some 20,000 or so are swarm around the bees. So when you see a ball of bees, if you've ever seen, that's the queen is in the center and they're moving her to her new home. Okay. And that's stunning. And then they make all that wax. For, they bake it from their body. They make bees wax from their body. Those hexagonal cells, if you've ever seen them, are perfect. How perfect? Well, ladies and gentlemen, amongst us all, I bet you most people have flown at least once on an airplane. Guess what? On an airplane, the fuel is kept and stored on the wings. How can that be? It can be, pardon the pun, because the, the fuselage mimics the honeycomb cells and its exact construction of the beehive to give it strength. How much strength? Well, a two pound honeycomb hive of, of, uh, in, in the hive, two pounds can hold 20 pounds of honey. Wowzer. So the bees have given us that. Bees and people are extraordinarily similar. Bees, just like us, well, they get they get sad, some bees. They, and genetically, we share similar genes with them. Some bees, like some people, are thrill seekers. That's right. Some bees, some, some bees 
could, uh, are able to recognize a human face. Bees can count. Bees can be trained to appear at four different intervals throughout the day. These creatures are unbelievable. How unbelievable? Well, ladies and gentlemen, there are many brain institutes. That is the thing between our ears, brain institutes that use the honeybee and, to, and study it for its incredible brain power. Bees, just like people, learn by uh, by what's called a top-down approach. That is that bees respond. They don't react. That's a very high, high mentation in the animal kingdom. As a matter of fact, if you take a human, so to put it into perspective, bees have about a little less than a million brain neurons. That's what each of us have in each of our retinas in our eyes. A human brain has maybe as many as 16 billion specialized brain cells, the neurons. An orca has a, the, the largest tooth dolphin has maybe uh, oh, 10 and a half billion uh, neurons in their, in their brain. And an elephant has maybe around 12 billion neurons. Pound for pound, if we take a human neuron, a honeybee neuron, an orca brain neuron, an elephant brain neuron, they are identical. It's just the degree of combination that differentiates each species. These little creatures are so wonderful. They, they work them, you know, a, a, a honeybee's life, a worker bee's life is about six weeks. In that period of six weeks, that little girl will, will perform at least two dozen different tasks and including in the last three weeks of her life, she will fly for honey or water or bee resin, uh, oh, excuse me, a tree resin or, um, or pollen. She'll fly 500 miles in three weeks and wow. she'll die because her wings wear out. They're indefatigable. They're an all for one, one for all creature. And we have so much to learn from these remarkable little, little friends. They, they have uh, approximately 230 wing beats per second. They are able to fly with a full load of uh, nectar or, or pollen or water or tree resin at 15 miles an hour, up to seven miles. And if they don't have a, a, a load of anything, they may be able to do 25 miles an hour. The people need to understand that if a honeybee stings you, she dies. Mm -hmm. The stinger is a last ditch effort to protect her. It is ripped away from her abdomen and she dies. Bees don't want to sting people. Bees don't sting bees. They don't get up in the morning and go, mm, yes, I think I'll sting somebody. No, they don't. So, so give them a wide berth, protect them. Don't ever use any chemicals in your yard because the chemicals are killing the bees and everything else. And I urge everyone to have at least one, but preferably two food bearing trees, apples, apples. We have, we can grow over 2,500 varieties of apples in every state of the union in our country. Apples are great. Apples are healthy. And apples, uh, uh, the, the why I uh, wish for apples and, and food bearing trees is because they have so many blossoms for the bees and other pollinators and become a safe source. We need to bring the insects back. We're losing uh, insects by the, by the drones. 41% of all insects are, are gone. And to put that into perspective, if you put all the insects on a scale and you put all human beings, almost all 8 billion of us, the insects, some 
some 900,000 different kinds of life, they weigh 19 times more than all the humans combined. The insects are the glue that keeps all land life going. And we're missing 41% of them. And as a result, we're missing 40% of the birds. The birds are tree planters. So we got to bring this back. And it starts with each of us in our gardens and our, our communities. Uh, we can affect change in our own home and then from our own home in our community and uh, for our children uh, join the citizen scientist groups and for anybody volunteer for any of these charities from the Audubon the, the birds to to any of the Center for Biological Diversity for for there, there's there's just hundreds of groups pick any any nonprofit and volunteer your time because it, they need us and if you can't give them two bucks a week or a buck a week you can give them a half hour of your time and this is a time for all of us to rise up because our planet is the only planet out of trillions and trillions in the sky every night that you look at that has life and water and all this vibrancy and it's so worth protecting wow well i definitely have a greater appreciation for bees and how incredible they are and all the different things that they can do it makes me think too that when we, we think of like other species besides humans i think we undervalue them because a lot of them don't communicate the same way we do. So we assume that they don't have emotions or I heard somebody else say that the other day that animals can't plan, but it sounds to me that bees definitely oh, yeah. plan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that's oh, incredible. Yeah, yeah I, I, I wanna leave you, you know, uh, also bees just like us, honeybees, they, they like to get a, a seven or eight hours sleep at night. But I think the most remarkable thing that I'm, I'm aware of, and it's touching, it touches me right at the core, you know, honeybees and, and orcas and elephants and, 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 um, and, and uh, 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 ravens and uh, so many other creatures, they mourn the loss of their loved ones. They mourn. They have that empathetic gene that they when they lose a brother or a sister or a mate or a daughter or a son they they have grief mm -hmm. and you know we we kind of made a mistake ladies and gentlemen we don't have dominion of this planet mm -hmm. because we are all one we we cannot exist without all of the creatures we they all have languages we know that the bees have a language uh, they dance the honeybees uh, some other bees uh, make noise and they have a language the the tree beetles the the beetles that eat trees they have a language they make noise we and and we know that the dolphins and the whales sing and have a language we have sadly failed because we are unable to decipher what they can. Get this, a dolphin can, uh, can interpret uh, some, there's 45 different dolphins, but, but the dolphins can interpret up to 50 human words. We haven't de deciphered one word of dolphinese. So how <laughs> intelligent are we? Not that intelligent, actually. And, and, and you know, I, on bended knees, uh, I know that the glue here is love. Love is the highest vibration. And I, I, I know that when you adopt a plant-based diet, you open your doors so wide for empathy. And after empathy, ladies and gentlemen, comes compassion. Mm -hmm. And with empathy, we love everything around us. And we all become caretakers. And that's what all of our children and the Gen Zs are. This is the new wave of caretaking our wonderful planet. We have a blueprint to protect half of 
earth and all the remaining ecosystems. I wander this planet, sadly now, uh, diagnosing what killed all the coral reefs and what killed all the forests. Now we have to protect everything that is alive because the well-being of the coral reefs and the well-being of the bees and the well-being of the trees ensures that our children will have a life. And it's very abrupt to say this, but if we don't fight now, there isn't a future. And not on my watch am I gonna watch, uh, see that happen. And I encourage everyone to get active now. Mm. Such a beautiful message, and you're just so passionate, and I can just feel the love radiating from your heart. So thank you so much for everything you do. So yeah. I just kind of want to summarize some of the things that we can do personally at home. So one of them, as you're saying, is move towards or adopt a plant-based diet. That's a big yes. one, something that I advocate for, not just for the health reasons, not just for the compassionate reasons, but because it's going to benefit our planet. Absolutely. Another thing that you're saying is stop using chemicals and pesticides that can kill the pollinators because we need these pollinators. We depend on them. And if they're yeah. gone, we have no food. <laughs> so yes. it's very important. <laughs> um, plant some uh, food bearing trees, some fruits, um, fruit trees in your, in your yard. What other yeah. things can we do in our own gardens, in our yards? Is it helpful to have like hummingbird feeders or bird yeah. feeders or does that stuff help too absolutely water well a little water bath and by the way the bees they were coming in to another summer the bees get thirsty and make a water bath a bee water bath you do that by uh, putting a, a bowl of water you fill it with either marbles or rocks allow some of them to poke above the water line because the, the, the bees need to perch and lap at the water. So, so uh, 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 go native, go plant native plants in, in, your, in your yard. Uh, uh, forget mowing the lawn. Turn your lawn into a native patch, which encourages butterflies uh, uh, and, and moths and hummingbirds, uh, plant milkweed, bring back the, the, the monarch butterflies, do any uh, 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 around your, your trees, uh, uh, put uh, wood chips. The wood chips help to conserve uh, moisture and they also uh, help to, to bring back the earthworms. Earthworms are our besties. They, they're, they're skilled plowmen and, and they make things fertile. And you are right, the, the, the single biggest thing that each of us can do right now to fight the climate in crisis is to switch to a plant-based diet. It's easy, it's healthy, it's water smart, and it's compassionate. Awesome. All right, so here's the controversial question, and I'm curious about this myself because I've never looked into this, but how about honey? Is it... A beneficial thing to eat honey, as some people have argued, should we be supporting honey production from beekeepers or should we be avoiding eating honey because it harms bees? I'm confused on this. Well, yes, it, it's a delicate matter. Uh, uh, purist vegans would excoriate me for, for saying this, and I am a vegan. Um, the, 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 the honey is, is, I view honey as a very powerful medicine. And I would say if some, someone's immune system is compromised uh, and you treat it as a medicine, absolutely. Uh, and, but, but get the honey from your local farmer's market or your, uh, a local beekeeper. You Google them and that way you directly support them. Why am I saying this? Because <clears throat> America consumes approximately approximately 300 million pounds of honey each year. And ladies and gentlemen, more than 50% of that comes from China. China uses the most terrible chemicals, even chemicals that we've banned. Is it on the shelf in, in honey jars? Not so much that as 
although it is mixed in some honeys, honey is the backbone of so many sauces, so many pastries, so many breads. So it's, it's part of our, our culture right now. We all need to be very careful with, with imported honey. So to reiterate that, honey is a powerful medicine. Use it when you're ill. Do not use it when you're not ill. Support our local beekeepers by Googling them or go to your farmer's market and be just don't buy uh, don't buy imported honey because it, it, it's like everything. You want to be as close to your food and preferably growing it uh, or, or knowing a person who's growing it because these chemicals are, are, are very, very serious. The, the nerve chemicals that are on our foods today to give the audience uh, some uh, idea of how powerful they are on a molecular basis, there some of them are as much as 10,000 times stronger than DDT. Mm-hmm. And, and when our little Einstein friends, the honeybees, come in contact with this, ladies and gentlemen, they, they lose their minds and they shake to death, mm-hmm. eerily like being hit full strength with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's all at once. Mm. You don't want to be putting those poisons into your body and you sure don't want to be putting them into your children's body. Mm. We have to be careful and, and, and it's up to each of us and our consumer choices each day. And the, the, again, I say we can change this because it is happening right now. It's not something that, oh, we don't need to worry about. Yes, we need to take the, the rose by the thorn right now and deal with it. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. And I think that gives me at least a good direction on the place of honey and where we can use it and how we can purchase it in a way that doesn't do more harm. You touched upon this earlier with the corn and the soy. That's one of the criticisms that people that choose to eat animals sometimes give towards veganism. They say, well, these monocrops, they're actually what's destroying the planet. They're killing more animals because of the agricultural processes that are used. So what can we do as vegans to decrease the harm from those monocrops? I know that for the most part, those are actually being fed to animals. So really it's not much of an argument against veganism, but is there other things that we can do to decrease our consumption of those types of foods? Well, I I mean, for me, yes. I mean, I, 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 uh, I'm not allergic to anything except oddly. um, I, 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 I can't digest corn. So the corn syrups be aware of, look, be aware that corn syrup is in just about, many things. (laughs) So step one is take your glasses. I'm an old codger, so I really do need to take my glasses. Read (laughs) the ingredients, right? I know this is a geeky, this is such a sciencey thing, but hello, before you purchase a product, like preferably try not to buy too much processed anything, but treat yourself to this uh, exercise. Pick the item up. Look at the ingredients. Ladies and gentlemen, if you cannot even pronounce those ingredients, you don't want to be eating them regularly. (laughs) And I I just, I mean, don't support, you know, if we don't support palm oil, which is hideous, if we don't support corn, if we don't support the soy stuff, then that's what individually we can do. As a vegan community, we are growing by the millions and our consumer choices Uh, do make a difference. And I think this is super important now because a lot of people think, well, you know, I, I, I couldn't really make a difference. That is not true at all. And, and the really uplifting data shows us that from Harvard university, that all it takes is three and a half percent of society demanding change 
in the in these nonviolent mass civil disobedient marches, whether it's for women, whether it's for climate, whether it's for the sixth mass extinction, three and a half percent of us, when we get active, society changes. Now, if you, why do I say that? Other than it, the obvious, if we look at all the vegans on planet Earth, some thirty to 40 million plus of us. If we look at all the Gen Zs, that'd be a couple billion of us. If we look at all the concerned moms and dads and aunties and uncles and grandpas and grandmas, if we look at all the activists, all the conservationists, all the teachers, all the scientists, ladies and gentlemen, we have this in Aids. We're go. We're forcing change. Whether the bankers, whether the oligarchs, and whether these miserable, feckless world leaders get it, we are change, and it's coming, and it's coming in the nick of time, right now. I love it. Oh, that's so great. So positive. Okay, so avoid the overly processed things. You stay away from some of these products that maybe causing some harm. Go vegan. That's a good first step. So now I want to know a little bit more about you. What personal habit are you most proud of? How did you develop it and how do you maintain it? I'll tell you what, and this is the heaven's truth. When I was knee high to a grasshopper a hundred plus years ago, <laughs> I couldn't write a sentence to save my life. I, I was a I was not a great reader. Um, uh, it was so long ago. Who knows if they could have even detected dyslexia? I don't know. But I, I was I was voted the most unremarkable student ever in the school. <laughs> <I attended. laughs> and, but but I I had the love of uh, my mom and dad who are watching over me in heaven. They were my they were I won the lottery. I had just loved caring parents and I had a will I, I knew from the age of was when I could walk two or three that I, I was going to get into the tree world and into nature my dad loved trees and I was determined to, to pull myself up by bootstraps and and I didn't fit the school paradigm right I didn't I just didn't learn from people too well I don't know why but I picked up books and I taught myself to read and I taught myself to write and I've just finished my I think it's my 12th or 13th book and I've never stopped and I'm I, I rarely toot my own horn but if I can do it ladies and gentlemen anybody can do it so you know set your mind to whatever your dream is and no matter what people tell you oh you can't do this oh you don't look right oh you don't sound right balls just do it oh so inspirational and i'm so grateful that you have this passion inside of you because we need you we need oh, you thanks. to spread your message we need people like you that don't give up even if they don't fit this mold you know, yeah. the mold of the typical, you know, teacher's pet or perfect student. Yeah. You didn't fit that, but you knew that you had something inside of you that was so strong that it had to come out. So thank yeah. you for all the books and your message. I appreciate Thanks. it so much. So speaking of all your books, how can listeners connect with you and what services and products do you have to offer? Well, come to Dr. Reese.com, D R R double E S E.com. And, and uh, there's lots for you to muck around on. And if you feel philanthropic, buy a book. <laughs> but there's a lot, there, you go to the library and you'll spend days reading neat stuff. And, and, uh, and the, the main thing is that my message is love love yourself, love your family, love your neighbor, and above all, love our planet. Aww. So now I want to close with a call to action. What can you leave my listeners with for the week? What is one thing that they can do this week to improve their lives and improve the health of our planet? Well, I'll give you two things. Don't get depressed, get active. And this is the greatest fight in seven million years of the humans occupying our planet. And I wouldn't miss it for the world.
Perfect. So well said. Dr. Reese Halter, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for your passion, for your energy, and for the love that you give the planet and other people. I appreciate you so much. Oh, thank you for having me on your show. Rock on. And I hope that you have a plantastic day. <laughs> Cheers. I hope that you enjoyed today's episode. Thank you for tuning in, and I look forward to having you back again next week. A very special thank you to the band Rocket Surgeons for permission to use the broccoli song. To find out more about the Rocket Surgeons, please visit their website at rocketsurgeonsband.com or Facebook at Rocket Surgeons Music. Please subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Also, all of my social media links can be found in the podcast description. Send me a message and let me know what you think of today's podcast. Sharing is caring. Please share, rate, and review my podcast and drop me a line if you have ideas for future episodes. Thank you once again and have a plantastic day. We're having broccoli.